Hi, I'm Corey Keyswetter, Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Forcepoint, and today I'm joined by Justin Crowley, who's going to walk us through a live demonstration of setting up compliance policies in minutes with force point one now before we jump into the demo i want to give a a quick update we here at force point you know we've been known for over a decade for our enterprise dlp uh capabilities that have been trusted by uh, a majority of the fortune 500 to protect their sensitive information and with force point one that we've introduced to the market earlier this year that already contains very advanced integrated DLP that's built into the platform. We're actually merging uh, the technologies and bringing some of the uh, great capabilities and proven out of the box predefined rule sets, DLP rule sets over to the new Force Point One platform. So these new rule sets include um, PII policies for 67 countries, PHI policies for uh, nine countries, and several other uh, regulatory compliance uh, policies like DIACAP, EAR, so on and so forth. And really the focus of this is taking these proven policies, out of the box policies, bringing them to force point one to continue to deliver on our promise of security simplified by making it easy to see quick return on investment, quick time to value, by being able to apply these policies, compliance policies, easily across all channels that you're managing with Force Point One. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Justin to walk us through. Awesome, thank you, uh, Corey. And, and yeah, as you mentioned, you know, being able to take the, you know, I call it the best of breed, right? Uh, secret sauce from DLP, and making the the, the Force Point One DLP even better, right? I, I thought it was phenomenal to begin with, and now it's even better. Um, cause, uh, you know, previously, you and I talked about, you know, agentless DLP, right. Highly recommend everybody to check out that content as well. But around this, you know, when we talk about the, the compliance and, you know, maybe classifying data, trying to figure out what data my users have access to, right. On average, most employees have access to 11 million files, right? So I'm guessing that person does not need access to that many files to do their job. Right. So using a solution like force point one okay, maybe that user shouldn't have access to that type of data. So now I can leverage force point one to create policy to say, hey, Corey can't download that file. He doesn't have access to that content because we're a multi-mode CASB, right? So we can control the data in motion. Hey, Corey can or cannot download or upload, um, excuse me, ITAR information, but we can also control the data at rest. Hey, Corey's trying to share or trying to change a certain file that's considered ITAR or PHI, PII. So we're gonna be able to control access to that content as well. Or maybe we're gonna encrypt the data, make it read only. But we can also apply that exact same policy to secure gateway. Maybe Corey is accessing a personal application on a corporate device and he's trying to upload certain information. We can control that. But then take it a step further and ZTNA, maybe Corey's accessing an internal application He's on the finance team or he's on within HR and he's accessing certain resources, right? He's allowed to do that, but we can now classify that and control that data based on all these different data patterns or data classifiers that we've now imported into Force Point One. And for any organization that's actually looking to pursue zero trust and advance down the path towards implementing zero trust security, Inline DLP is definitely a core aspect of that. As Justin mentioned, there is a uh, some research that showed that on average, the average user has access to 11 million uh, files. That is excessive access. Zero Trust is specifically focused on ratcheting down uh, control so that we don't have excessive access. You have the principle of least privilege access. You only need access to, to the resources, the documents, the applications that you need to do your job and not more than that. And this is a, a, an elegant way of being able to help ensure you're, you're advancing towards that goal and doing so without complicating the administrative workload. Exactly. So here's a list of all these patterns that we have available. You know, we, some people call them patterns, some call them classifiers, just a combination of, you know, PAI, PHI, HIPAA, GDPR, right? Patterns that we can now look at data for, compare them to, and determine if this file is considered, you know, Australian PAI, Australian PHI. But you can see in the bottom corner here, I have over 190 different patterns that I can now create policy for. 
But in our case, right, we're focused in on uh, regulatory compliance. So in my case, you can see I have the different metadata that I can look for, the region and the type. So right now I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I'm concerned or I'm more, I want to create policy where so the metadata is around that regulatory and compliance. So the click of a mouse, I can now look at every single pattern that I have here. So I got 12 here that are focused in on that regulatory and compliance for, in this case, you know, U.S. and Canada federal reg regulations. I can see cool. the description, the region, and what type this is. So in this case, a predefined one. I'm not an expert. I don't know what exactly is around ITAR. I don't know what is exactly around, you know, the EAR federal regulations. So I can rely on Forcepoint to create that policy for me. And actually, to that point, so EAR and ITAR can be tricky. Um, basically, any organization that's creating or, or uh, selling products that can have dual use in uh, military applications or, or private applications, that's where ITAR comes in. And EAR would be coming in covering things that are more explicit military use um, products, including software, things like that. So there may be a lot of startup organizations that are doing some advanced, you know, data analytics software, stuff like that, that they might have interest with uh, some military contracts, but not a, a lot of expertise around building DLP policies, building regex that matches those sorts of um, those regulations. So instead of having to go through this, this work yourself and, and spending you know, potentially countless hours trying to uh, create these regex patterns that you may not be familiar with. Here you go. You have them all out of the box and you can, we can even go further. So can we show, for example, uh, let's say this organization that's making software for data analytics, they want to apply um, both EAR and ITAR. Can you show how to get more advanced and, and bring multiple predefined policies together in one rule? Exactly. So if I click on, say, the AR, you know, I give the, the description of what it's looking for. I can even test the pattern. So if I do have a sample file or some information that I want to verify, hey, you know what, I want to make sure that this data does not get leaked. I can test the pattern without even implementing policy. I haven't clicked import. I haven't done anything, but I can still test this pattern. So in this case, I'm going to say, you know, I tested it. Great. Um, I want to be able to put this into my policy. So I'm going to import this into my own tenant. Now you may say, hey, what, what is this actually doing? So the nice thing is, again, we have this list of 192 different patterns. Not all of these are relevant to me. So if I'm creating policy or looking at my own DLP library, I don't need to scroll through 192 every single time I wanna find a policy that's relevant to me. So I'm importing this into my own little library in my tenant, right? I'm gonna go down to the ITAR as well, right? I see the information, I can test it, great, I like it. It, I'm going to import this into my own little library. So now, if so I go this to way, yeah. So yeah. this way, when you go over, let's say on the other hand, let's say we were a, a healthcare agency or you know hospital system, then we would only have in here uh, things like PHI, medical records data, which are predefined policies that we have in here. So that you're only looking at the set of predefined rules that right. matter to you, as well as the ones that you create um, to kind of augment and go further. Yeah, and you can see the ones that have been imported, right? We see our predefined and the type one I see advanced or file fingerprinting, simple. Those are ones that I've created. So in my case, I'm going to go down here and I can look for my, well, I can even filter again, right? So I can search if the name contains, let's say EAR, right? And I can see there's my EAR regulation there. So that's in my own tenant. So I can now go ahead and create policy. Right, so I'm going to show a couple of things here. So I can go to my policy and say, great, I want to be able to block on that information. So a couple of things that I can do here. I can go to my policy. I can maybe add a new rule here and say, hey, you know what? If somebody is on, let's say, the compliance team, right? So, hey, if you're on the compliance team, right, I'm going to say, you know, access method, right? Are you coming through single sign-on? What type of device are you accessing, right? Are you on a corporate managed device? What type of user agent? Maybe I want to block mobile devices. Location, hey, you know what? I only want this being accessed if you're coming from HQ, right? Or if you're coming from HQ and the branch office, 
And I mean, this this can make uh, a lot of sense. So particularly any EAR related contracts and data are maybe that organization wants to strictly control that sort of information. So it's only accessed from a managed device uh, that has, you know, a- agents on it. It's only, you know, able to be sent through certain applications and that information would be blocked from basically any other website or application that is not predefined, you know, since the EAR would be that something that you would want to put additional controls around. Yep, exactly. And so I can go in here and say, you know, do I, do I want to control the download or the upload? So in this case, maybe I want to say the download, right? So now I can go through here and find my EAR, federal regulation, and then you control what do I want to do? I want to block it. I can add watermarks once it gets blocked and set up my notification here, right? Now I could go in here and then now go and select for the the ITAR, right? So there's my ITAR and I can create another rule. Maybe I want to encrypt that data, notify. So I can create rules that reference both of these. Now, say I have multiple patterns. Maybe, you know, if I go back to my policy, there may be four or five different ones that I want to create policy for. Now, again, you could go in here and create multiple rules and reference all these, put in different actions. But there, a that. specific use case for that would be in the healthcare one, because we do have multiples for uh, medical record number, health data, PHI, which would be, so a lot of healthcare organizations might want to set a rule that would capture all of that. Exactly. So if I go back to my DLP objects, right, one prime example, I'm based in Canada here. As you can see, I have one looking for, you know, Saskatchewan driver's license. Quebec drivers, there's a there's a tongue twister, right? <laughs> if anybody can, you know, that's a Saskatchewan, right? You know, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Labrador, you know, Newfoundland, British Columbia. So I create a rule that references one, two, three, four, you know, a bunch of provinces. Or you'll notice I have this advanced pattern, right? So if I can click on this, you'll notice that the criteria references multiple patterns. Right, so I can see, hey, if the count for Canadian driver's license for British Columbia is one or higher, Ontario one or higher, Saskatchewan, I can do the exact same thing when it comes to maybe my EAR or my ITAR. So I can create my own patterns, right? So my advanced, and I can create a pattern that says, hey, if the count for, well, you know, say, you know, the EAR one, right? Well, here, let's actually create the the rule here, right? So if I actually go to my EAR, let's get the exact name, right? So one thing I can do is take that name, create a pattern and say, you know what, if the count for EAR for regulations, what are my quotations here? Maybe I wanna do a count and say, hey, if it's greater than or equal to three, right? Or I can create and statements and say, hey, if you see the uh, you know federal regulations or and then reference that ITAR. ITAR, right? yeah. So if it's one EAR or more than three ITARs, go ahead and block that or notify our compliance team that oversees um, the, okay. those EAR and ITAR products. Right, and it doesn't even always have to be a, a counter as well, right? We have all these different, uh, you know, um, Boolean expressions. Boolean expressions, the different uh, operators that we have here to allow you to say, hey, you know what? I, I see this a lot with, with social security numbers, credit card, PII, HIPAA. Hey, if a, if a user has access to a file that just contains one record, maybe I don't need to block that. Maybe I'll do an alert that, hey, this user accessed this file. But hey, a user accessing, you know, with multiple patient records or multiple, you know, um, you know ITAR, EAR, uh, compliance records. Okay, that's where I want to now start digging deeper. I want to do the encryption. I want to block it. I want to do, you know, more alerting. So that's the nice thing is, yes, there are predefined, right? But what you can do is you can still create your own, right? So Corey, early you mentioned, hey, you know what? I'm not an expert on, you know, different federal, federal, federal regulations. So I'm going to import this. Hey, maybe you are, maybe you spent hours and hours on weekends, you know, creating, you know, figuring out the regexes for, some of these uh, these tags, well, you can create your own, right? So I can create, I'm gonna bring this up. You can create your own simple patterns, right? And I can look for certain keywords, certain regular expressions, right? And then we have our different validators. We can validate, right? Against different things here, right? We have our lunch checksum, 
you know, different uh, ID numbers. So again, we give the, the customer the ability to say, hey, you know what? We're going to do the work for you, but you can then take it a step further and create those advanced patterns to reference multiple patterns, or you can create your, your own uh, simple pattern. You can look for your own regexes, right? You can look for file fingerprinting. Maybe you have a file that contains all the different codes. Maybe there's a a waiver that gets filled out or some purchase order that gets filled out, we can fingerprint that file. Right? So we See, can- this is one of the things that I love about the platform is there's there's flexibility. There's multiple options to address multiple level, levels of expertise. If you're advanced and, and want to build advanced regex dictionaries uh, and, and things like that yourself, by all means, you have the capabilities to do that. If you want to, if you need, uh, uh, if you have a smaller team that's not, uh, as adept in, in building some of these, there's a wealth of predefined classifiers and ways of building them, um, adding them together, doing additional things with them that we provide documentation on. And another thing uh, that you were highlighting just now is the file fingerprinting. So yes, 4.1 is an SSE uh, solution. It's a, a cloud native uh, security service edge product. You'll see a few others uh, in the market that are also in the same category of product. But one thing that I wanted to highlight on the file fingerprinting, because of how this is built, because of how Force.1 is architected with the um, polyscale architecture that automatically builds out and expands the infrastructure as the workload increases. So, you know, sometimes we'll see this with um, Customers have, you know, several thousand employees spread around the globe. Maybe they have a sales kickoff or a conference where they all come into one location. So the resources at the closest uh, data center or pop of ours can multiply out to hand, handle that additional load. Same thing with the ad- exact data matching. When you're using, you know, uh, exact data matching via API for a specific cloud app, ours can expand out to allow you to go through enormous uh, amount of rows in in hours instead of days, which you would see with other um, solutions that aren't built with that hyperscaler architecture, that are built on old 90s ways and early 2000s ways of of building their own physical data centers, especially with the supply chain issues that we've seen over the last few years. Some of those providers have network issues and have a, are having issues getting additional equipment into the data centers to address how um, the changes and how people connect. Whereas the hyperscaler that we're built on, there's billions of dollars of networking alone in that infrastructure that we're reaping the benefits of. And that goes directly to our customers in terms of availability, reliability, uptime and performance. Yeah, that's well said. So last couple of things here before we we end for, for the day here is, you know, we've taken those DLP patterns, right? We wanna look for certain things. Right. So the last thing I want to cover here is really around that policy control, right? I showed you earlier, hey, we can create a rule for, for finance, but I just want to go through some of the, the rule structure where, you know, being able to say, hey, certain users can access this data, right? So we have our contextual access control here, right? So I mentioned uh, earlier, we're multi-mode CASB, right? Being able to control in line and the data that's at rest as well. So maybe I want to create a rule that says, you know what, we're going to say the finance team, right? We'll go back to maybe the finance team this time. Right. Hey, finance, we're going to allow you to download, we'll say, the, the ITAR here data, right? So ITAR will say, finance team, you can download it, but we're going to encrypt that data, right? We're going to notify, we're going to set up a block page, right? And we're going to generate an alert. I'm going to send the user an email, and I'm going to send a group of admins um, an email as well, right? So I have a way to tell my organization, hey, Justin, downloaded this file, right? But now I can go and say, you know what? Well, also, I want to say, you know, the compliance team, right? Maybe the compliance team, right? They can access that content. But if they go to download that, right? We'll go to ITAR again, right? Where's my ITAR? We're going to the ITAR and say, you know what? We're going to make that file read only for them, right? They can view it, but we don't want them to make any changes, so again, I could set up my notifications here, right? Set up my pop-ups and generate my alerts, right? So I can click on save. So now I know the finance team, they get a certain policy. The compliance team gets a certain policy and that's great. That controls the data in motion, right? Our inline protection, preventing an upload or download, 
As you can see, I have API as well. I can control the data that's at rest. So I can add policy, right? I can say if the status matches any DLP. So if it does match my EAR or my ITAR, I can say, hey, block that. I can say how it's been shared, right? I can say who's the owner, who has it been shared with. I can select the data patterns themselves here as well, right? So I have full control on all avenues, right? Is the data being uploaded? Is it in motion? Is the data that's at rest? And I can control how that file has been shared, right? So with our SSE solution, being able to call ourselves a multi-mode CASB, right? Not all CASBs are created equally. Some do a great job at just inline protection. But now what if the data is already there? How do we control it? Some do a great job at just API. Great, they can control the data while it's in the application. What if I don't want it there to begin with? What if I want to control download? They lose visibility, right? We bring on, you know, the best of both worlds, right? We can do this agentlessly, right? There's another uh, pitch for our agentless uh, DLP. We can do it with agents, right? So if a user has our smartest secure gateway, we can have in policy or in place for there, as well as API, right? ZTNA, right? We talked earlier about consistency, right? Being able to say, hey, it doesn't matter if a user is going through secure gateway, right? I can say, hey, if you're accessing file sharing, well, guess what? I can apply that same policy here as well. So there's my EAR. So within a click of a button, I've now applied that DLP object to secure gateway. So now anybody downloading that file or uploading for secure gateway, I can control that. I control it through my Google workspace, right? I can now go down to my ZTNA. Maybe I have a Synology NAS that has that data. Well, hey, if somebody tries to download that file off of that NAS, right? So if I find my, my ITAR here, right? Hey, let's go ahead and deny that as well. And see, I, this is, uh, again, I, I coming back to the point of, how things used to be done was so fragmented and having fragmented approaches where you're using, you know, the any data protection capabilities built into this specific application and another set for my private apps. And you end up with multiple different instances, a lot of them not using the, um, the same ways of identifying the same information. So you've got inconsistency with how uh, a private app might be flagged uh, for a DLP event versus, uh, or the efficacy of, of a, you know, identifying a, an exfiltration event in a private app versus each individual cloud app because you're using the tools there. Or you have a separate CASB and a separate ZTNA. It's still gaps, redundancies, leading to fragmented visibility and ineffective controls. Whereas now, with this, with a unified platform, and you create the, you spend the time creating your DLP policies in that DLP section once, and you can inherit it and easily enforce it across any and all channels that you need. That is taking the complexity out of cybersecurity. And especially, you know, with a great resignation, more and more people leaving organizations, being harder and harder to find security experts. Well, now I can do more with less. I don't need to overburden my team that is already short staffed. I can give them a way of using their time more effectively to spend more thought and focus on the strategic issues that matter to the business. Yeah, well said. All righty. So thank you very much, Justin. I appreciate you walking us through this. And for anybody and everybody watching, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us, request your own private demo so we can walk through how this may work for you in your environment and your specific use cases. Thanks. I look forward to hearing from you soon.